the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hasaliah. Now it happened in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa the citizen, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We've acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes and the rules that commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there, I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Alice. Good morning, everybody. In case you don't know, I am Glenn. I'm leading the ministry team here at... Uh, to Kai Community Church, and uh, we are busy in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah this term. If you've been coming week after week, you will know that. It's the, uh, the record of the, re of the exiled Israelites and their return back to the promised land, their return back home after their Babylonian exile. And speaking about exiles who are returning back home, it's great to welcome Des and Jenny Inglesby here today. <laughs> Uh, Des and Jenny, a founding pastor, a couple of our church, uh, uh, 40, 41 years ago. It's great to have you back home, Des and Jenny. It's lovely to see you here. Um, say hello to them afterwards. 40 years, long before you and I were born, eh, Lorraine? <laughs> and um, it's, great, uh, it's great to see them here. Uh, and speaking of exiles going home, um, is Susan Newkirk here? Susan is here. Susan, most of you will know Susan, is uh, one of our mission workers. She's been working at our Westlake Church uh, and been doing excellent ministry there for a number of years. And uh, this is to let you know that Susan's uh, exile in South Africa is coming to an end and she's going back home to the States uh, after a number of years here with us. And we'll be saying a, a much bigger farewell uh, in October. Uh, just going back home mid-October. So we're going to miss you, Susan, and all the work you've done here and the impact that you've made on so many lives. We're so grateful for that. 13 years you've been here, 13 years, which is, incidentally is the space between Ezra and Nehemiah, 13 years. <laughs> um, a, a, a gap between Ezra and Nehemiah, and Nehemiah is uh, um, about to head back 
uh, head to Jerusalem. Uh, let's have a look at that passage. Father, thank you for uh, these books in Scripture. Thank you that here too is rich supply for us. Uh, will you, Lord, um, open our eyes to see the treasures of these truths and so apply them in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're beginning Nehemiah now. It's a continuation of what's been going on in this period of Israel's history of the restoration uh, of the temple and the city of Jerusalem after the exile in Babylon. Uh, remember these four sections that we uh, looked at at the beginning of our series? Uh, all these four sections speak of different aspects of the restoration of Jerusalem and the temple. First of all, in the first six chapters of Ezra, we saw that picture of restored worship as the temple was rebuilt. And then Ezra came and brought God's word and restored the law uh, and the word of God to, this, to the life of God's people in Jerusalem. And now we're in Nehemiah, looking particularly at the concern to see the city restored and particularly the city walls to make Jerusalem safe and, and secure. Uh, and that's uh, the great focus of Nehemiah. Nehemiah's story, as you'll see in our chart that I put together for you, which I show you often, Nehemiah's story comes very much near the end of this 100-year, almost 100-year period, 100-year-plus uh, period between um, the first return of the exiles way back in 537 and, and um, the final sort of section of Nehemiah was around about 4, 4, 40, 4 30 or so. Um, and Nehemiah comes uh, whew, about just over 90 years after the first exiles um, returned to Jerusalem. So this is quite far along on this time span during the reign of the Persian king Artaxerxes I. And a particular episode is recorded here which spurred Nehemiah on his mission to go back to Jerusalem and help to secure the city. Two things I want you to see this morning. Only two, because the second one is particularly long. So, two things I want you to see this morning. I want you to see, first of all, the heart of God's servant. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, or Hasaliah, Hakaliah. We don't know much about Nehemiah's family, unlike Ezra, but we know that... Um, he had a prominent position in the court uh, of the Persian king. In the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Susa is uh, the place of the summer palace for the king of Persia. And whenever winter came, they, uh, they would go to Susa for the winter. Isn't that nice to have a palace where you can go to for the winter? Wouldn't you like that at the moment? <laughs> a little summer palace where did you winter this year? I wintered in Susa, um, in my summer palace. Anyway, verse 2, Hananani, no, it's just Hanani, uh, one of my brothers came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. Hanani uh, might well have been Nehemiah's actual brother. We knew nothing about him until some time ago when they discovered some papyrus uh, in an ancient Israelite community that was in Egypt along the Nile River. And in some of these papyrus documents that they're still busy unraveling and translating and, and interpreting, uh, Hanani is mentioned a number of times as being an official from Persia, a Jewish guy who had some official uh, uh, responsibilities over Judah and Jerusalem. So obviously his time, his period of service is finished and he comes back to Persia and speaks to his brother Nehemiah and tells him about the state of things in Persia. He says there in verse 3, those who survived the exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. It's interesting that he talks like that because we're looking 90 years in. I mean, these are the grandchildren uh, of the original exiles, but still talks as if they are the exiles. Um, uh, even these many generations down. Nehemiah himself sees himself as an exile, but um, he was born and grew up in Persia. Um, and I mean, I, I mean, it makes sense because the children of exile still see themselves as exiles. It's, uh, it was interesting to read about 
exiles of um, apartheid exiles who were born and grew up outside of South Africa in the days of apartheid came home in the 1990s and saw themselves as exiles, though they had lived their whole lives outside of our country. But they came back as exiles. It's the same picture here. And so uh, Nehemiah is asking about them, and he hears the sad news that the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. And now, remember I told you in Ezra, if you were following with us, that there were many periods of opposition to the work that the exiles were doing back in Jerusalem. And through, under the reigns of a success of Persian kings, there were successive episodes and opposition and uprising against the work of the exiles back in Jerusalem. And this is one that happened under King Artaxerxes back in Ezra chapter 4. We, there was a little um, record of it there where the local opposition to the work of the Israelites got the king to stop the work and they forced them violently to stop the work. And that seems to be what is being referred to here. And so when Nehemiah hears this news in verse 4, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. For some days Nehemiah mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. What a great uh, picture of the heart of someone who's concerned for the things of the Lord and the things of the kingdom of God. It drives him to his knees in prayer and fasting. And not just for five minutes, but for five days. Actually, this period of his praying and fasting uh, uh, until he actually got an opportunity to make his case to the king is around about four months, because chapter 2 verse 1 tells us that it was in the month of Nisan which is four months after uh, the month of Kislev, that uh, he finally gets an audience with the king and to make his case. Uh, and just think about that. I mean, I don't know how long you can manage with prayer and fasting. Me, not so much, four months. Don't think, don't think I would make that. I struggle to make it for a day. It's hard work. But he is so, he is so um, vexed over the situation in Jerusalem that it brings him to his knees because he is brokenhearted for the things of God's kingdom. Even though he's far away, uh, he's concerned for a country he's never been to um, and for a city that he's yet to visit because it's God's city and God's people. It's important to think in this for a while, sit here for a while, because we are very much in a quick solution orientated world, a very much in a quick solution orientated church. And like we just can't fathom four months of prayer and fasting. We just can't fathom that as even being useful these days because we're very solution oriented quickly and get things done fast. And you know, uh, no one has time for that. Everything's Everything is instant now. No one can concentrate for more than, I don't know, a TikTok dance or something like that. You can't, can't, you know, that's about as much as we can give our minds to these days. And this whole aspect of like waiting on the Lord in prayer and fasting just seems, it just seems so foreign today. And I remember growing up as a Christian, they'd, you know, there'd be these prayer meetings that would go on for hours in the night, and they'd sometimes have these prayer concerts where God's people would gather and pray for hours on end. Um, I just don't see that these days. It just doesn't seem to be happening like that anymore. Quick fix church, that's what we want nowadays. Quick fix. Um, and waiting on the Lord it just, just doesn't seem to be part of our vocabulary now. And I'm praying that the Spirit of God is changing that in our hearts and convicting us to get back to that. Uh, the reality is the church is not going to grow through professional ministry success. Uh, the church of God is going to grow because God's people persevere in prayer. You know, even when you read the biographies of the great preachers and the great pioneers of the gospel in the past, when you read those biographies of all of those great heroes of the faith, those missionaries and so on, and the amazing things they accomplished. When you read the biographies, you see what is missed in the kind of thumbnail sketch of the biography. It's how much time those men and women spent on their knees. How much time they spent 
in prayer. We miss that. We are not going to see the gospel change our land uh, just through spectacular live church productions or slick online videos or you know, hiring professional image consultants. We're not going to see people change through that. We are going to see change when God's people are brought to their knees in desperate, repentant dependence on God. It's the only way it's going to work. We've seen this again. We've seen this last week. We're seeing it again here. We want to see a revival of biblical proportions that begins with repentant prayer on our knees. Nothing else. No other formula that will change that. Now let's look at what this prayer uh, is all about. Look at the content of this prayer, secondly, this prayer of God's servant, which begins there in verse 5. And what we have here is another one of the great model prayers of Ezra, Nehemiah. One of the great model prayers of Ezra, uh, of, of Nehemiah here. Uh, lots of commentators pick up on the parallel of this prayer to the Lord's Prayer. And it certainly does have that same type of structure uh, uh, and, and formula in a sense, which shouldn't surprise us because uh, they both prayers to the same God. And so that should form the, inform the structure of the prayer. I want you to see how this prayer um, comes together here. It, first of all, begins with the knowledge of God. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Verse 5, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commands. Here is Nehemiah beginning his prayer by appealing to God on the basis of who he is, not who we are. See, that's how prayer begins. We don't present ourselves to God and say, we're the great and awesome person deigning to give you some of our time. No, we come to the great and awesome God, the faithful God who keeps his covenant with those who love him and keep his commandments. His prayer is informed by who God is and begins with that recognition of who God is. He's great, faithful, covenant-keeping, loving, and approachable, verse 6. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you. God makes himself available to hear the prayers of his people. He is approachable. He is knowable. God, uh, God makes himself known to us. You can come and know who you're praying to. You don't have to, you don't have to kind of like think about it, you know. Um, what's that children's prayer from the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hello, what's your name? You don't have to think like that. You don't have to wonder like who God is. You don't have to make up your own mind about who God is. You can know him as he reveals himself through your word. Um, I remember when I was a uh, presiding bishop and doing that task that Des and I did of looking after all our 150 odd churches. One of the interesting things I discovered was um, when I traveled around, how many people thought that they knew me? Or had an idea that I'd said something which I never said. Or did something which I would never did. But stories spread and people made up their minds about who I was. And what I'd done or what I'd said. Normally something terrible. Or because I'm the boss. And, and when I meet these people I discover about I never said that. I, I never did that. And do you know people do the same thing with God. They make up their mind about who God is. And then that's how they operate. They operate with this with this mindset that this is who God is because they have made up their mind that this is who God is. And in this relativistic world, that seems to be very acceptable, that you just decide that this is what God is like, and then that truth becomes my truth, which becomes the truth. But you've just made that up. You've just decided that this is what God is going to be like. You heard somebody say it, you took on board the bits that you liked, and you and you've functioned with that. But God doesn't tell you to make up your mind about what God is. He tells you who he is in his word. And that flies against where our society is these days and where our world is these days, where everyone decides what their truth is. We, 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 that's, how, that we, that's what all these crazy YouTubers tell us and media tells us and songs tell us. 
that famous classic song, that greatest song of all time? Well, not really. Uh, boy's own. What a great band they were. Uh, how the lyrics go. No matter what they tell us, no matter what they do, no matter what they teach us, what we believe is true. Oh, really? Oh, I'm going to have my first wedding dance to that one. You know, I can tell you this. No matter how hard I believe that I'm a 27-year-old supermodel, <laughs> it's never going to happen. doesn't matter how much I affirm it and assert that I'm a 27-year-old supermodel. It's never going to happen. And it doesn't matter if you all jump on board and affirm my delusion. Don't you dare get in the way of his truth, her truth. It's not going to be it's not going to happen. It's not true. Because the mirror, like God's word, will tell you the truth. When we approach God, we approach the God who reveals himself to us through his word. And the more you understand who God is through his word, the more accurately it will reflect in your prayers to that God. Our prayers are shaped by the knowledge of the God that we pray to. And the more we know him through his word, the better our prayer life will be. And the word of God, oh, the word of, God of course, does not just give us an understanding of who our God is. But in the light of that, it also helps us to see who we are. Because the word of God reflects not just who God is, but reflects who we are. It is the mirror that we need to look into. And it will show us just who we are as sinners in need of a merciful God. And look at the second thing that uh, Nehemiah does in this prayer in verse 6. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant who is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. That's the second aspect of what he does here. He confesses sin. We've acted very wickedly, he says, towards you. We've not obeyed the commandments, decrees and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember, like we saw last week, there's this corporate aspect of this prayer. We, Israelites, we have acted wickedly. We have not obeyed. <laughs> Nehemiah could say he's not personally responsible for some of these sins. But he recognizes here the corporate culpability that we are sinners before a holy God. No one is exempt from that. And that's an aspect of a biblical understanding that when we see who God is, we see ourselves as we are and we can say that we are the sinners. That corporate aspect is part of that. And confessing that sin is part of our recognizing who we are before a holy God. You know, I was listening to a TV preacher a little while ago, and he was berating, he was berating his TV audience and his, and his uh, stadium audience. He was berating them for praying and, uh, and confessing sin in prayer. He was berating them and saying, that's not what you should be doing. You know, Jesus has forgiven your sin. It's your weak faith that makes you pray confessing sin. It's weak faith to pray like that. You must pray confidently. Give me this, Lord. I'm standing, um, I'm standing righteous before you. Give me this. And it's weak faith to confess your sin and ask for forgiveness. Uh, and I'm like, uh, hang on a minute. Um, can Jesus object? Because didn't Jesus, Jesus teach us to pray in that Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Oh, has Jesus got weak faith? You know why we pray that prayer daily, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us? Not because we need to secure God's forgiveness again and again. The cross secures your forgiveness. But when we pray that prayer, we come back to the fact that God is God and we are not. We are sinners in need of great mercy. And when we ignore that prayer, Acknowledging our sin, we're going down the road of Adam and Eve. Because Adam and Eve's great temptation 
was to be like God. And when we remove that acknowledgement of our sin from our prayers, we are making ourselves bigger and God smaller. And if we remove it from our prayers, we just add to the constant sinful temptation in our lives to think too much of ourselves and too little of God. This model prayer includes confessing sin. And then Nehemiah moves towards his petition by reminding God of his covenant promises, thirdly. He says there in verse 8, Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the furthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I've chosen as a dwelling for my name. He has Nehemiah appealing to God's own promises from his words through Moses in Deuteronomy that if you're unfaithful, you'll be scattered. Okay, too late, that's happened. But if you are obedient and repent and return, I will restore you to the land. He appeals to that very promise. He appeals to that promise. And he appeals on behalf of the Israelites with this prayer of repentance. Please restore us to the land as you have promised. Remember I said this again last week. I said this last week and I'm saying it again this week. Don't pray prayer. Don't think you can pray prayers and claim promises that God hasn't given. Even if a prophet gave them to you, check with Scripture. Pray according to the promises that God has given in His Word. Otherwise, you'll be very disappointed. And you can pray boldly for the promises God has given through His Word. But be wary of praying boldly for promises that God hasn't given you. I remember my neighbor when I was a kid, her brother. She was in her 30s, and her brother had liver cancer. And she begged God daily. She used to go to a church at the bottom of our road. In those days, the churches were open every day, and you could go and pray in them. And she used to go and pray in that church every day. And she'd been there for an hour, two hours, every day, praying for her brother to be healed. And she had the idea, as we were talking and stuff like that, uh, family to family, that um, God would hear her prayer because for all the hours she had given to prayer, she deserved an answer. That's how she felt, that she deserved an answer. She'd given God all of these hours for prayer, and he deserved to answer by healing her, her, her brother. And, of course, he died. And when he died, I could see something broke in her. Something broke in her when he died. She was never the same again, and she never went down the road to that church ever again because God had let her down because she wanted a promise delivered that was never offered. It was never offered. You see, students of God's word know what promises to pray for. And prayer, as Dale Ralph Davis says in his work on this book, Prayer takes hold of God's promises, turns them into petitions, and sends them back to God. But you've got to know what they are. You've got to understand that God hasn't promised to heal your Uncle Toby. But he has promised that if you do pray, he will hear you and he will answer according to what is best for us. That great Sentence in 1 John 5. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. You see, we always cut out the first bit. And then we have people saying, whatever you ask, you, you have it if you ask it of him. But you missed the, the verse before that. If we ask anything according to his will. How will you learn what his will is? You will come to his word and beseech him on the basis of these promises. And you can claim those promises. When God says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, you can sue him for those promises. You can sue him for those promises. You promise you'll never leave me or forsake me. I'm in this terrible place. I claim that promise. And he's given it. You will always do what is right and good. You can claim that promise. And that is the foundation of your confidence for approaching God 
in prayer. You can call him on these promises. And what is the basis of these promises? It's his redemption. Look lastly at the last aspect of the prayer here in verse 10. This redemption that is affirmed. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Again, like Ezra, Nehemiah is using Exodus language here. This redemption that he's talking about happened 1,000 something years before this. He's, he's referring to that redemption. That great rescue of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt centuries before. He says, these people now are the ones that you rescued. Actually, no, they're the great, 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 grandchildren of those. But he talks as if it's them. That's the basis of his appeal for God to act now in restoring his people. Because these are the people you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. See, that's the basis of our appeal too. We appeal to God on the basis of what he has done for us in the past. Not what we're doing for him. We don't get answers to prayers because we're doing good things. We get answers to prayers because God has done a good thing for us. It's always been that way, by the way. This is always the understanding. And a, and a, and a well-informed Jew in the Old Testament times understands that God saves by his redeeming grace, not by obedience to the Ten Commandments. It's not a New Testament novelty. It's always salvation by grace. It is always salvation by a God who redeems and rescues his people into a relationship with himself. It is always that. God saves his chosen people by his mighty hand of redemption. Not because we're an obedient people. Not because we're well behaved. But because God redeems sinners. And it's these four pillars of understanding that inform right prayer to God. And then after all of this, he finally gives his petition in verse 11. Let your ears be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant. And to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today in granting him favor in the presence of this man, the king. And then he, this next verse really introduces chapter 2. I was cupbearer to the king, which tells us that Nehemiah is in a providential position. He's, the right, he's right there next to the king of Persia. He's a cupbearer. It's an important role. It's not just the guy who carries the cups. There's an important role. Old, uh, uh, old King James Version calls him the butler. The butler to the king. But it's, it's really more than that. He's an entrusted person. He's close to him and gives him an opportunity four months later to bring his request to the king, which the king, as you'll see in chapter 2, grants. But Nehemiah's prayer is a great template for our prayers, appealing to God's character, confessing sin, trusting in the promises of God, and appealing to the redemption that God has accomplished for us. It's a great template for us as we bring our prayers to God. And I also don't want you to miss, looking at this whole picture in Nehemiah chapter 1, and of Nehemiah, the one who prays before God, he's acting very much as a mediator between God and and God's people. He's praying to God. He's appealing to God's character on behalf of God's people. He's appealing to God's covenant faithfulness on behalf of God's people. He's, a, he's confessing the people's sin on their behalf. He petitions God for intervention on behalf of the Israelites, even though they haven't even thought about it. He's praying on their behalf. He's petitioning on their behalf because Nehemiah, my friends, is a model of a mediator between God and God's people, of a mediator that is to come, one who won't just pray like this, but will also be the answer to this kind of prayer, a greater Nehemiah that is to come, none other than Christ himself. Jesus, my friends, doesn't just make prayers based on the knowledge of God. He reveals that knowledge to us, as you see in this chart. He reveals that knowledge to us. Jesus doesn't confess the sin of God's people. He takes it on himself as a substitute, as 2 Corinthians 5 tells us. Jesus doesn't appeal to God's promises. He secures them 
by his obedience to the covenant. The promises that are ours are, are secured because of Jesus' obedience. We'll never measure up to the full obedience required for that. The redemption that Nehemiah affirms is fully and finally accomplished by Jesus. Not an exodus from slavery in Egypt, but a rescue from slavery to sin through the redemption, as Colossians 1 tells us, that he accomplished at the cross. The work of this mediator is seen in its fullness in Jesus, who comes before God, not just on behalf of some exiles in Persia, but all exiles from heaven, scattered across the nations, even here in Cape Town today. Because of Jesus, you can come with this prayer for God and hear him answer. Because of that mediator, as Hebrews assures us, we do not have a high priest, a mediator, who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Have you come to know this mediator? Have you come to know this Jesus who is mediated between you and God on your behalf, taken the sin that separated you from God upon himself so that you could approach God, our Heavenly Father? Have you come to this Jesus? Why don't you do it now, even as we pray? Let's come before God. Oh, you are the great and awesome God. And you are the God before whom we confess our constant guilt and failure to live according to your words. And we do appeal to your promises to restore those who repent and turn to you in obedience. And we base those prayers upon the great redemption that has been secured for us through Jesus and his death on the cross for our sin. Thank you that through Jesus... We can come before you confident that you will answer. Have you come before him? Maybe your head is bowed now and you're praying this prayer for the first time. Cry out to him and say, Jesus, I come before you to secure my forgiveness, to secure my relationship with God as I turn from my sin and trust in you. Oh, we come before you, our heavenly God. Holding nothing to support our claim to righteousness, but holding to Jesus and all that he has done for us. Hear our prayers. Answer our prayers. On behalf of the church on earth, Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit. Oh, and bring that revival. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.